Hi and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around I got five movies that I've only seen for the first time in the last 36 hours. All of them are good. Two of them are spectacularly good. And the nice people over at Umbrella Entertainment sent them to me to review. There are two Australian movies. There are two from South Korea. And there's an English movie made by an American director in the 1960s. And all of them should be in your collection somewhere. I'm leaving the two absolute best ones for last. But I'm going to start with the two Australian ones, which are fun, and both of which are directed by women, which is a good thing because female Australian directors, with the possible exception of Jane Campion, often don't get enough love. This one's by Emma Kate Krogan, and it's a kind of personal, it may even be a romantic play. They're both from 1996, these Australian ones. And this one's kind of fun. It's a low-budget story about a group of film students at Melbourne University on one really weird day in their lives. And it's a little thing called Love and Other Catastrophes. Now, I'd heard about this. I'd seen it on the shelves of video stores back in the 90s, but I never really engaged with it at all. It stars Francis O'Connor and Rada Mitchell. There's a lot of stuff that I like about this because I know the environment. I was in Melbourne in the 1990s. I didn't go to Melbourne University. The only time I ever went to university at all was in the 1980s, where on Saturdays I would go to the University of New South Wales and play Dungeons and Dragons with my friends. So that's my extent as far as my experience of university is concerned. But this one's kind of fun. It's very much got the vibe of the 1990s. It's got some in-jokes of Australian film culture with things like Paul Harris turning up in a cameo role. Paul Harris, very big film critic. He did a show called Film Buffs Forecast on 3 R Radio for a very long time. There's also Adrian Martin, a superb film critic, playing himself in this movie. And Love and Other Catastrophes is just a great guerrilla low-budget indie film in that very 1990s style. There's some meta use of a university professor talking about the films they're going to talk about, and they're going to look at the auteurs theory, and he's using Hitchcock as his example, whereas most of his students want Tarantino or Spike Lee or, for some reason, Woody Allen. There's lots of those kind of meta jokes in there. There's some good supporting actors, people like Kim Gingell turn up. I'm bringing them to put this out as a part of their ongoing project to get as many reconstructed Australian films of the past out to audiences. There's the cover, as I said. It's on a J card, and the back of the J card has the extras. I'm not going to freeze frame that. There's an audio commentary from the director, Emma K. Krogan, and an interview with the actor, Matt Day, who plays one of the characters. And this one's a fun movie. It's good-hearted. It's fun. One of the cool things for me, and this is very much in-house, is there's a scene set outside Rumbarella's, a cafe that was in Brunswick Street, Fitzroy. And we used to go there a lot. I went there in the 90s. And middle-aged geek girl in the 2000s had her 30th birthday at Rumbarella's. So that was kind of cool. So there's the package with the j cut. This one is Region B, and it's a limited edition of 1500 Get it while you can. There's the front. There's the front and the back. I like that because... I can probably hypnotise you with that if I try really hard. Inside we've got alternative artwork. You've got the reversible cover, which allows you to get rid of the Australian censorship classification, which is the bane of my existence. So what I think about the film, it's very much a kind of film for people who went to film school. But it is amusing, it's fun, it's kind-hearted. There's not a mean character in there apart from Kim Gingell's character. And it puts a pin into a moment in time, in a certain time and place. And it's a lot of fun for that. I, I enjoyed it. It was fun. But because I didn't have that same experience of going to university and sharing houses with university, I shared houses, but I never went to uni to do it. I got less from it than other people might. Still a good film, still worth checking up. And there's a really interesting Australian rom-com from, again, 1996, directed by Megan Simpson Huberman and starring Guy Pearce and Claudia Carvin. Dating the Enemy. This is just such fun, and I went in cold, and I didn't know the twist. The twist is on the back cover, so I'm not going to not tell you the twist. So the story's pretty simple. There's a woman called Tash who works as a science journalist for a newspaper that is now owned by Rupert Murdoch, and a guy called Brett, played by Guy Pearce, who is a VJ on a TV show talking about pop music. They're kind of opposites attract, 
He's very unpunctual and tidy. She's messy but punctual. And they meet at a party and start a relationship. And we cut to a year later when the relationship is in trouble. He's getting a job offer to go to New York. She's stuck in a shit job in a shit newspaper. And they break up on a cruise on Sydney Harbour. Then overnight, they swap bodies. So it's a body swap movie. And I didn't know this going into it. I just thought, what's happening here with the special effects? Body swap. Tasha's in Brett's body. Brett's in Tasha's body. And they've got to try to live the other person's life. They meet up and try to help each other organise the, their day-to-day. -day. It just is a lot of fun. Again, it's not a large budget movie. It's shot beautifully. Sydney looks great in this. And I long for the days when you could get a flat in Willamaloo without having really rich parents. And there are some really nice establishing shots over Sydney Harbour, which never photographs badly. Having said there's a body swap, there's also the gender stuff and the fact that they've known each other for a long time, they've been in relationships. And Guy Pearce and Claudia Carvin do a great job of playing the other character. It's not an easy thing to do sometimes, particularly when you're paying another gender. But they do really well. There's a good supporting cast in this one as well. But the thing for me that really nails this as a fun, enjoyable movie is they don't shy away from the implications of the concept. There's stuff like Tash gets her period while Brett is in Tasha's body. And there's also some sexual encounters while they're in the other person's body. So the whole idea of gender is flipped on its head. And it's used as a way of the character understanding everything the other gender goes through. It's not an anti-men thing. It's not an anti-woman thing. It's incredibly even-handed. It's got its tongue firmly in its cheek. It's a fun rom-com. And the supporting cast is pretty good as well. Uh, Matt Day's in it again. Uh, Lisa Hempley playing the, Tasha's best friend. Does a really nice job on this as well. It surprised me how much I liked this film. I'd seen it again on the shelves, but because it was a rom-com, I didn't really engage with it at the time. In 1996, I was watching Basket Case and Troma films and Charles Band movies and things like that. I wasn't really engaging with rom-coms at that stage. Here's the package. You got a J card again. Special features, audio commentary by the director and the cinematographer Steve Arnold. Interview with Matt Day. A 1996 Channel 7 interview with Megan Simpson Huberman, the director. Romantic TV trailer and a comedy TV trailer. So, yeah, um, this one is a deep cut. So there's your J card, which I've just taken off. There's your front cover and there's your back cover, which looks like the start of The Simpsons. This one, too, is uh, a 1500 limited edition. There's some alternative and very 1990s cover art there. There's your back. Region B again. And there's your reversible cover. I did enjoy this film. And I wasn't expecting to as much. But it's light-hearted. It's poppy. It's fun. And it still doesn't steer away from the implications of the concept. And I think that's a smart movie in a movie. So there are two Australian ones that I saw. Then I saw two South Korean movies. And Umbrella is really, really good at finding deep-cut South Korean movies from the 20, early 21st century which I knew nothing about. They did it with I Saw the Devil and a number of other films. But this one is called The Quiet Family. And it's directed by Kim Ji-woon. And the story is an extended family set up a business in a hunting lodge in the mountains in South Korea. And they're trying to get business. The father has decided that this is what they're going to do. So the father, his wife, his brother and his two daughters set up this hunting lodge in an area of mountainous South Korea where there's no really good road. There is a plan to get a road through. It's not widely used. They've been set up by a local businessman and mayor for his own purposes. So eventually they do get a guest who ends himself on the night he stays at the inn. And he does it quite gorily. And because they can't find his wallet, they think somebody may have killed him, but they're not sure. And was it a family member who did it? So in order to not tell anybody, they bury the body in the hills. Because of course you do. Then they get other guests, and the other guests start dying as well. And they, of course, bury the bodies as well. And then it escalates. It just gets madder and madder. And this family is trying to deal with the fact that they've got to dig up the bodies and bury them somewhere else. Because the road that's being built is going to go right where the bodies are. 
They've got to hide the bodies. The police get involved and send a police detective to stay overnight at the place. Meanwhile, the corrupt businessman has got his half-sister and his father to stay at the lodge, with the plan being that he's going to send a hitman to kill the half-sister overnight. And that doesn't go right. It's a mad, dark comedy, and it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of gore in it. There's a lot of dead people in it. But the family is still kind of fun. The, oh, they also have a son, and he is um, a sleazy bugger. Now, the funny thing about The Quiet Family is it was loosely remade in Japan as The Happiness of the Katakuris, which is a lot of fun as well. If you haven't seen that one, you should. And it's been remade um, in Tamil as another movie, and it was remade in two other Indian languages. So it's a concept that really lands. Now, there's actually two actors in there that you might know. There's Song Kang Ho, who, you will, who is going to turn up in the other South Korean movie I talk about. And there's Choi Min Sik, who played the serial killer in I Saw the Devil. And he is really good in this, in an earlier and kind of lesser role. And Choi Min Sik, I've always liked as an actor. He was also in Lady Vengeance, done a number of things. Great character actor. Song Kang Ho, I like as well. He is particularly good in the other movie. But this one is very much a dark comedy. Uh, the family dynamics kind of interesting. The way they kind of are very matter of fact about burying these bodies and at one stage um, ending somebody. It's just mad. It's transgressive, but it's fun. If you like the Adams family, you're going to like these people. And then, of course, you can always watch The Happiness of the Katakuris if you want it. This is the collector's edition that I've got here. And there's some beautiful artwork on it by Colin Murdoch. Uh, this one's a limited edition of 1,000. You can only get it from the Umbrella website. I'll post a link to where you can buy this and a standard edition as well. As I said, beautiful artwork there. I'll just peel the sticker off the back so you can see. There's the room number and the key on the back. Now, because this is a collector's edition, you do get some extras, but I'll show you the discs first. There's a slipcover with the same stuff on it. There's alternative artwork as well. Another horror movie the ruthless comedy this one is region b again inside you get the reversible cover which is very cool and there's that disc i like as well with all the family shushing you so you don't tell them so you don't tell anybody what's happening and of course we get a poster because in the collector's editions you always get a poster and this one is actually the korean poster for that one and there's an alternative Korean poster on the back as well. You get two other things. You get the art cards, and I'll show you them. There's the two sisters. There's the mother and father um, at a moment of crisis. There they are sitting behind the counter at the inn. There is the mother booking in two of the people staying in the hotel. There's one of the creepy sisters. There's the family ensemble. There's a guy who comes in who's actually a policeman investigating by staying overnight at the hotel. And there's a shot of the family having dinner. But there's even more, and I like this particularly with South Korean films and foreign language films in general. There's a booklet which explains the cultural context and things like that. There's a behind-the-scenes experience and the artwork as well. There's uh, an article here called The Last Dance, Kim Ji Woon's The Choir Family, written by Bastian Merezade. And we get that in there. Safe Houses of Quiet Families by Haley Scanlon. There's another essay in there. And we also get how the artwork for this edition was created. So there is some interesting stuff there. But I really like The Quiet Family. And again, it's a movie that is. When's it from? Let's look up when it's from. It goes all the way back to 1998 because it is the director's first movie. But I enjoyed this one a lot. It's, it's low-key. It's fun. There's some really interesting camera work, particularly at the start, where the camera takes you around the inn so that when she gets real, you're very familiar with the layout of the inn and you can figure out, yep, they're upstairs now, they're in the hallway. This is where the counter is. This is where the family lives. All of that kind of stuff. And it landed for me. I enjoyed it a lot. So there it is. The Quiet Family. As I said, I'll post links. 
Then we're going back to the 1960s and swing in London. And then one of the movies that actually helped London be the swinging thing it is is from 1965, directed by John Schlesinger, starring Julie Christie in the role that got her an Oscar, Darling, which also stars Dirk Bogart, Lawrence Harvey, a movie that was off my radar. I didn't know anything about it. I don't even know if it ever got a VHS release here in Australia. It's about a woman called Diana Scott, played by Julie Christie, who's a model. She uh, gets picked up by a television presenter played by Dirk Bagard, and they start a relationship. Um, he breaks up his marriage to be with her. She then moves on to a slimy businessman, played wonderfully by Lawrence Harvey, because she's a social climber. She wants to be in the upper class, even though she was born middle class. And part of what Schlesinger does with this is makes it a very dark comedy. Right at the start, they're putting up posters for an interview with her for a posh magazine. And they're putting up this big billboard. And to put up her billboard, they're pasting over a billboard of starving children in Africa so that they can put up a billboard about her. And there is a voiceover from the character where she starts talking about her life. And the voiceover is very much an unreliable narrator. Because what we see on the screen isn't what Diana is saying about her life she's making a miss it goes in a really interesting direction towards the end where we see where diana ultimately ends up and that surprised me and it relates to something in history of about 30 years ago which is kind of interesting in a way but it's in black and white it's got a really nice score by john dankworth and i really like dirk bogart in it julie christie's character who is Selfish and narcissistic is really, really good. Lawrence Harvey playing the slimy, oleaginous, wealthy, posh cad really well. It's, it's shot on location in London and also in Italy, in Capri and, and other parts of Italy. I didn't know anything about this movie. I was surprised to see it. I like that cover art, which is very cool. And on the other side, we have really nice caricatures of Lawrence Harvey and Dirk Bogart there as well. The artwork on the slipcase is by Dave Loopy Dave Dunstan. And I think he's excelled himself with particularly the back there. This is a limited edition of 500 in the collector's edition from the website. And inside you get another slipcover with really nice black and white photography there. And on the back it says, a powerful and bold motion picture made by adults with adults for adults which means that it's definitely not a Star Wars movie. There it is on the back. Inside you've got alternative artwork, and I like the artwork on this. That is choice. And so is the font and everything about it. Inside you've got the reversible cover, of course, Australian censorship, blah, blah, blah. And you get a poster. And I'm going to tell you what the extras are on the disc as well. There's Dave Dunstan's artwork there. And on the back you've got that one. This, If I was going to hang this up, this is the side I'd use. I think that artwork really pops it. There's a very 1960s movie sensibility about it. But of course, collector's edition, you get a lot more. Julie Christie was one of the it girls of 1960s London. And um, this is a movie that nailed that for her. There's a great picture of her. Julie Christie and Lawrence Harvey. Again, the same. Julie Christie and Lawrence Harvey. Lawrence Harvey. And by the way, some of the production design and the sets in this, particularly some posh apartments and things, is really good. Julie Christie in knee socks, and she's one of the people who popularised knee socks with mini skirts in the 1960s. Dirk Bogard and Julie Christie. Great Dirk Bogard role. Came out roughly the same time he did Victim, the role that changed his career. There he is again. And there is Julie Christie's Diana with an Italian prince. We also get a booklet. There's where the action is John Schlesinger's Darling in the Films of Swinging London by Andrew Nett. And Lawrence Harvey, Brilliant Disguise by Guy Davis. So there's an essay about Lawrence Harvey and his career. And there's another one, Outsider on the Inside, the feature films of John Schlesinger. So you get a lot in this one for the value. And Darling surprised me. I didn't expect it to be as arch and knowing and kind of complex about a female character who didn't have traditional morality. You've got to remember this is 1965. It's a movie that says that women can...
police their own sexuality and can make their own life decisions. And Diana is not naturally monogamous. And also, there is a point at which she has a pregnancy termination, which in 1965 would have been shocking. But from a modern viewpoint, it is a woman controlling her own reproductive system. And so it plays better to a modern audience. And the character plays is more complex to a modern audience, whereas the average 1965 audience would have been very, very judgmental about the character. And nonetheless, Julie Christie won the Oscar for it. I enjoyed that one a lot. Again, I knew nothing about it, but I enjoyed it a lot. And it's got some feels about it, a little bit like The Barefoot Contessa from the 1950s, the Joseph Mankiewicz movie, and a couple of other ones with ambitious women in them. But this time, it plays it a little bit differently, and it plays it in an interesting and groovy 1960s way. And the extras on the back, I'll put up a picture of this so you can read along with me. Feature-length audio commentary by Nathaniel Thompson and Howard S. Berger. Emergent female identity, Julie Christie and the 60s Zeitgeist, a visual essay by Melanie Williams, which I've watched and which I really recommend. The War at Home, Kim Newman on Dirk Bogard, and Kim Newman does a really good overview of the career and life of Dirk Bogard. And there are trailers, so you've got a lot of solid extras on the disc itself. That takes me to the movie I... Did I enjoy it? The movie I... Yeah, the movie I enjoyed the best. Park Chan Wook's movie from 2000. And it took me a while to realise this was a, a movie almost a quarter of a century old. JSA, Joint Security Area, on 4K. This is a limited edition of 1000. Because it is on 4K, it is all region. Two discs... One 4K, one Blu-ray. Lots of extras on this one, but I'll show them to you in a bit. This movie blew me away. I knew about it. It was I knew it was a kind of thriller and a mystery about an incident on the demilitarized zone separating North and South Korea. And something happens. Some soldiers from North Korea are killed. A soldier from South Korea is injured in the border incident. And an independent... Uh, task force and the independent observers and the independent security force that monitors the border. In this case it's Switzerland and Sweden who um, run the investigation are tasked with going to both North Korea and South Korea and finding out what really happened. There's a South Korean soldier played by Lee Byung-hun who's injured in the incident. There's also a North Korean soldier played by Song Kang-ho who is tremendously good in this movie. He plays Sergeant Oh, who's a North Korean soldier who is also wounded. And there's official explanations of what happened. The South Korean government and the North Korean government have decided what happened. But an independent investigator, a major from Switzerland, Sophie E. Jean, her name is, she's played by Lee Yong A, who is half Korean and has never been to Korea before is brought in to investigate what's going on and to basically Colombo the thing. Meanwhile, there's the tensions on the border. There are tourists who come to the border and use it as a tourist spot. There are also the soldiers themselves. And there's another soldier um, called Nam, played by Kim Dae-woo, who was with um, Sergeant Lee, played by Lee Byung-hun, on the border at the time. And all of them are seem really distressed. Sophie has to figure out why. And so we get her investigation, then we get flashbacks, and we find out what actually happens on the border. And it's not what anybody else thinks. It's not what the official story is. It's not the information that Sophie is getting from the soldiers. Not going to go any further there because it gets complex and it does get spoilery. It's an incredibly good movie. It's one of the best I've seen this year. And Park chan does a fantastic job of this. And we know Park chan from things like Old Boy and Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance and the Vengeance Trilogy and all of those films. And, and it takes a really complex look at the tensions and ideologies in the Korean demilitarized zone. Again, this is a collector's edition, so it's got a ton of stuff in it. As I said, 4K and Blu-ray. There's your hardcover. The cover art is by Will de Villiers, by the way. There's another one of the scenes. Inside we get a slip cover with the same artwork on it. Then we get the cover itself with alternative artwork. The inside we get the 4K and the Blu-ray. 
and we get a poster but this poster is a little bit different and there's one side of this poster that I really really like there's an important image from the movie on that poster and the alternative is a Korean style um, poster which I really like and I've got to make sure it's all on the screen there that I like a lot of course we get art cards because we always get art cards on the collector's editions there's Sophie and again there she is this movie could have played a bit like a few good men but it didn't it goes much deeper and goes into the history a lot better there's the protagonist there's a standoff there's the checkpoint at the border there's one of the most telling images in the film and of course we also get a booklet there's the booklet cover and inside there's a Bastien Mirasone um, essay Divided We Stand Park Chan Wook's Joint Security Area If One Dies The Other Does Too The Shifting Perspectives in the Division Film by Haley Scanlon Secrets Lies and Hidden Truths in the Images of Park Chan Wook's JSA by Anton Vettel so there are a ton of extras on this one. Uh, we've got audio commentary with Park Chan Wook with English subtitles. Audio commentary with director Park Chan Wook, actors Song Kang Ho, Lee Byung Hun, Lee Yong A, Kim Tai Wo, and Shin Ha Gyun with English subtitles. The JSA story archival featurette, making of the film archival featurette. About JSA, a series of archival introductions by the to the film by members of the cast. Behind the scenes montage, opening ceremony footage, litter from a private music video, take the power back music video, theatrical trailer, TV spot, interview of Park Chan Wook, and a behind the scenes stills gallery. So you're getting your money's worth on this one. And we've got the Will de Villiers artwork explained there as well. Um, JSA blew me away. I loved it a lot. It's an intense movie, and it's a very human movie. I mean, there were bits where I almost teared up in this movie, and that hasn't happened to me for at least a week. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. It's just one of the best movies of this century so far. I'm counting 2000 and 21st century. Don't at me about it. It's just convenient to do that. And it's a movie that had a lot of guts, too, because to talk about these things in such a complex and nuanced way in South Korea where that border is a constant peril and a constant concern is a brave move and i think park chan wook does it in a nuanced and humane way and a way that is so free of propaganda it's admirable in a lot of levels there are the five movies that umbrella entertainment sent me this month it's a powerful month you've got the two australian rom-coms directed by women from 1996 both of them you've got darling a movie that needs to be better known and better regarded than it is it's a really fine piece of 1960s filmmaking that doesn't get mentioned anywhere near as much as all of the macho bullshit guy movies and then you've got two south korean films one from 1998 one from 2000 which reminds us that much of the good cinema in the world is not made by people who are english speakers and who come from english-speaking cultures a lot of the films that really move cinema forward are from outliers from people from other areas from people who see the world differently because they live in a part of the world where the world is different i'm still buzzing about these five movies because five movies i haven't seen it's kind of rare for me to see in a row and it gives me a lot to digest as well because each time you see a movie you've got to digest it mentally and to see five movies in a row that are all worth checking out and in three cases at least, are exceptional, has done my head in, in a really great way. So again, thanks to Umbrella Entertainment. I will post links to all of these in the description of the video. So that's it for this time around. Thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Let me know if you've seen any of these movies or which ones you want to see as well. You can also support the channel by becoming a channel member or else by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash terry talks movies and i give you a few extras for being part of that team next up i've got the wednesday video i don't know what i'm doing i'm still digesting these movies but i will find something for the wednesday video 
And then, of course, we roll into Science Fiction Saturday again. And I've got a lot of good ideas for that one. So, until next time, watch some good movies. Don't watch any bad movies this week. See if you can go through a whole week without watching a bad film. And I'll catch you next time.